Welcome back to the Last Days Book Club, where today we start a new book entitled The Heavenly Man. The story of Brother Yun, a dramatic autobiography of one of China's courageous and most intensely persecuted house church leaders, which will turn your heart to prayer and praise. The book is written by Paul Hathaway who is the International Director of Asia Harvest, an organization committed to serving the church throughout Asia. Permission to read this book has been granted by the holder of the audio rights, English publisher SPCK Group and Lion Hudson, trade names for the Society for Promoting Christian Knowledge. Today we begin our reading of this fascinating book with a foreword by Brother Yun's friend, fellow persecuted Christian, and author Zhang Ranglian, as well as an introduction by the author, Paul Hathaway, before beginning chapter one, entitled Humble Beginnings. I joyfully read Brother Yun's entire book in one breath feeling great excitement in my heart and soul. It seemed to take me back to those fervent times and recalled many precious memories. Brother Yun and I were born in the same region, went to the same church, and labored together in the harvest. We cried, rejoiced, and preached together, and were rejected together. We ate in the wind and slept in the open air, stuck together through thick and thin. We loved each other as blood brothers. Yun and I worked together for many years until we were arrested in Nang Yang. In the prison, we were put in separate cells, but we cried out along the prison corridors hoping our voices would be heard as a source of encouragement to each other. We tried to slip notes to strengthen each other in the faith. Yun's testimony is written with blood and tears. His journey has been one that encountered many bitter struggles. Instead of complaining and grumbling, he learned to tackle all obstacles prayerfully on his knees with God. Chinese believers remember Yun as a brave man who often prays on bended knee, raising his hands in thankfulness to the Lord while tears streamed down his cheeks. After many unbearable situations, God not only opened the iron gate of the prison for Yun, but is also using him as a blessing to both the Chinese and the Western churches in this new century. Brother Yun is gifted at making contact with believers from different church backgrounds, gently bringing them together in unity. Like a thread, God has used him to combine different colored patches into a beautiful cloth. In recent years, Brother Yun and I drifted apart as our paths took us in different directions, and I sometimes even reprimanded him from afar. Yet, when I heard the reports of how God was using him and learned about the path he has faithfully followed, I could only admire him and blush with shame and self-reprimand. In the Chinese church, I have seen many of God's servants come with great power and authority. But with Brother Young, I saw a servant of Jesus who always came in humility and meekness, reflecting the heart of the Son of Man, who did not come to be served, 
but to serve and to give his life. I pray you will enjoy and be challenged by this book as much as I was. Zhang Ronglian, founder of the Fan Chen House Church Movement in China and author of I Stand with Christ and the Courageous Life of a Chinese Christian. Next, we have an introduction by the author of this book, Paul Hathaway. On a warm September evening, a small group of Christians gathered at Bangkok International Airport to welcome back Brother Yun. It had been more than eight months since we had seen his smiling face. In January 2001, he had been arrested. During the first few days of his incarceration, the prison authorities almost beat him to death. Later, he was sentenced to seven years in prison. Occasional messages were carried out of the prison to his concerned friends around the world. One said, God has sent me to be his witness in this place. There are many people here who need Jesus. I will be in this prison for exactly the length of time God has determined. I won't leave one moment early, and I won't stay one moment too long. When God determines my ministry in prison is complete, I will come out. Miraculously, in God's perfect timing, Yun was released after spending just seven months and seven days of his seven-year sentence. Now we were gathered at the airport, hoping to see him arrive. Would he be sick, tired, and quiet after his harrowing ordeal? Suddenly, Yun appeared in the arrival hall. He was none of these things. His face was full of light, and a wide smile stretched from ear to ear. Praise God! Hallelujah! were his first words. Glory to God! We held hands and bowed our heads in a prayer of thanksgiving as bemused passengers hurried past us to their check-in counters. Brother Yun is known throughout China as the Heavenly Man. This nickname stemmed from an incident in 1984 when he refused to tell his real name to the authorities. Divulging his true identity would have endangered local Christians. In reply to the threats and beatings of the Public Security Bureau to reveal his name and home address, Yun shouted, I am a heavenly man. My home is in heaven. The local believers, who were still gathered in a nearby house, heard his shouting and knew he was warning them of danger. They all fled and avoided arrest. As a mark of respect for his courage and love for the body of Christ, house church believers in China called Yun the heavenly man to this day. Yun is the first to admit that there are parts of him that are not heavenly. Like all of us, he struggles against temptation and weakness and deeply realizes that apart from the grace of Jesus Christ in his life, he amounts to nothing. He once told his wife, Di Lin, we are absolutely nothing. We have nothing to be proud about. We have no abilities and nothing to offer God. The fact that He chooses to use us is only due to His grace. It has nothing to do with us. If God should choose to raise up others for His purpose and never to use us again, we would have nothing to complain about. Oswald Chambers once wrote, if you give God the right to yourself, He will make a holy experiment out of you. God's experiments always succeed. This is certainly true 
of Brother Yun. From the time he first met Jesus Christ, he has endeavored to serve him wholeheartedly. There are lessons and experiences from Yun's life that can greatly encourage Christians around the world as they seek to follow the Lord Jesus. Brother Yun's testimony is one that reflects the faithfulness and goodness of God in his life. His is a story of how God took a young, half-starved boy from a poor village in Henan Province, China, and he used him to shake the world. Instead of focusing on the many miracles or experiences of suffering he has gone through, he prefers to focus on the character and beauty of Jesus Christ. He wishes the whole world to know Jesus as he does, not as an historical distant figure, but as an ever-present, love-filled, all-powerful, almighty God. In researching this book, I interviewed dozens of Christians in China who were eyewitnesses of and completely verified the events contained in the pages that follow. Interspersed throughout this book are short contributions from Di Ling and a few Chinese house church leaders. These insights will help the reader gain a different perspective and a more complete picture of some of the key incidents in Yun's life. Most of Di Ling's reflections were made while her husband was in prison for the sake of the gospel. It has been said, it is not great men who change the world, but weak men in the hands of a great God. Those who know Brother Yun can vouch that he is a humble servant of God who does not want any part of his life to bring glory to himself or man. Brother Yun desires that his story would focus all attention and glory on the only true heavenly man, the Lord Jesus Christ. By Paul Hathaway, author of this book, The Heavenly Man, and the founder and director of Asia Harvest. Chapter 1 of the Heavenly Man, entitled, Humble Beginnings. My name is Liu Zhenying. My Christian friends call me Brother Yun. One morning in autumn 1999, I awoke in the city of Bergen in western Norway. My heart was stirred and excitement bubbled up inside me. I had been speaking in churches throughout Scandinavia, testifying about the Chinese house churches and inviting Christians to join us as we evangelize all of China and the nations beyond. My hosts had asked me if I would like to visit the grave of Marie Monsen, a great Lutheran missionary to China who had been mightily used by God to revive the church in different parts of my nation from 1901 to 1932. Her ministry was especially effective in the southern part of Henan province, where I came from. Miss Monsen was small in stature, yet a giant in God's kingdom. The Chinese church was not only impacted by her words, but also deeply challenged by her sacrificial lifestyle. She was a fully committed, uncompromising follower of Jesus Christ, who showed us an example of how to suffer and endure for the Lord. God used Marie Monson in a powerful manner so that many miracles, signs, and wonders followed her ministry. She returned to Norway in 1932 to take care of her elderly parents and by then her work in China was complete. She never returned to China, but her legacy of uncompromising faith, unquenchable zeal, and the necessity of changed hearts 
fully committed to the cause of Christ, lives on in the Chinese church today. Now I had the great privilege of visiting her grave in her homeland. I wondered if any other Chinese Christian had ever enjoyed the privilege I was about to enjoy. When she came to our part of China, there were few Christians, and the church was weak. Today, there are millions of believers. On their behalf, I plan to offer thanks to God for her life. Our car pulled up at the graveyard, situated on the side of a hill in a narrow valley with a river flowing through it. We walked around for a few minutes, hoping to see her name on one of the several hundred tombstones. Not being able to locate Monson's grave immediately, we strolled to the office for help. The administrator was not familiar with her name, so he looked in a book that lists the names of the dead who are buried there. After flicking through the pages, he told us some news that I found hard to believe. Marie Monson was indeed buried here in 1962, but her grave was left untended for many years. So today, it is just an empty lot with no headstone. In Chinese culture, the memory of people who did great things is cherished for many generations to come. So I never imagined that such a thing could happen. The local believers explained that Marie Monson was still held in high regard and that they had honored her memory in different ways, such as by publishing her biography decades after she died. But to me, her unmarked grave was an insult that had to be made right. I was deeply grieved. With a heavy heart, I sternly told the Norwegian Christians who were with me, you must honor this woman of God. I will give you two years to construct a new grave and a headstone in the memory of Marie Monson. If you fail to do this, I will personally arrange for some Chinese Christian brothers to walk all the way from China to Norway to build one. Many brothers in China are skilled stone cutters because of their years in prison labor camps for the sake of the gospel. If you don't care enough, they will be more than willing to do it. I was born in 1958 during the Chinese leap year, the fourth of five children in our family. I came into the world in an old traditional farming village named Liu Leo Zhuang in Nanyang County, in the southern part of China's Henan province. Henan contains almost 100 million souls, China's most populated province. Despite this fact, there seem to be many open spaces where I grew up, lots of hills to scale and trees to climb. Although life was difficult, I also remember times of fun when I was a little boy. All of the 600 people in our village were farmers and still are to this day. Not too much has changed. We mostly cultivated potatoes, corn and wheat. We also grew cabbages and other kinds of root vegetables. Our home was a simple structure of compacted dried mud. The roof was made of straw. The rain always managed to find the holes in our roof, while in winter, the icy winds never failed to blow through the gaps in our walls. When the temperatures dropped to below freezing, we burned leftover corn husks to keep warm. We couldn't afford coal. Often in the summer, it was so hot and humid that we couldn't bear to sleep inside our poorly ventilated home. Beds were dragged outside, and our whole family joined the rest of the village sleeping in the cooler air. Henan means south of the river. The mighty yellow river 
dissects the northern part of the province. Its frequent floods have brought centuries of pain to people living along its banks. We knew this as we grew up, but to us, northern Henan was a million miles away. Our village, nestled in the hills of the southern part of the province, safe from devastating floods and outside influences. We were only concerned with the next harvest. Our lives completely revolved around the cycle of plowing, planting, watering, and harvesting. My dad always said it was a struggle just to get enough food to eat. All hands were required in the field. So from a young age, I was called into action, helping with my brothers and sisters. Consequently, I didn't have the opportunity to attend much school. In other parts of China, Hina natives have a reputation for being as stubborn as donkeys. Perhaps it was that stubbornness that prevented the Henanese from receiving Christianity when Protestant missionaries first brought it to our province in 1884. Many missionaries labored in Henan without much visible success. By 1922, after almost 40 years of missionary effort, there were a mere 12,400 Protestant believers in the entire province. Those who accepted the religion of the foreign devils were ridiculed and ostracized by their communities. Often the opposition spilled over into more violent expressions. Christians were beaten. Some were even killed for their faith. The missionaries, too, faced great persecution. Missionaries were considered by many people to be tools of imperialism and colonialism sent by their nations to gain control over the hearts and minds of the Chinese people while their governments raped the land of its natural resources. The outrage against foreigners reached its peak in 1900 when a secret society called the Boxers instigated a nationwide attack against foreigners. Most were able to flee the carnage but many missionaries were located in remote rural areas of inland China, far from the safety of the large coastal cities. The Boxers brutally massacred more than 150 missionaries and thousands of their Chinese converts. Those brave souls who had come to serve our nation sacrificially and bring the love of the Lord Jesus Christ to us were slaughtered. They had come to share Christ and to improve our lives by building hospitals, orphanages, and schools. We repaid them with death. In the aftermath, some people thought the events of 1900 would be enough to scare missionaries off from ever coming back to China. They were wrong. On September 1, 1901, a large ship docked in Shanghai port. A young single lady from Norway walked off the gangplank onto Chinese soil for the first time. Marie Monsen was one of a new wave of missionaries who, inspired by the martyrdoms of the previous year, had dedicated themselves to full-time missionary service in China. Monson stayed in China for more than 30 years. For a time, she lived in my county, Nanyang, where she encouraged and trained a small group of Chinese believers that had sprung up. Marie Monson was different from most other missionaries. She didn't seem to be too concerned with making a good impression on the Chinese church leaders. She often told them, You are all hypocrites. You confess Jesus Christ with your lips while your hearts are not fully committed to him. Repent before it is too late to escape God's judgment. 
she brought fire from the altar of God. Monson told the Christians, it wasn't enough to study the lives of born-again believers, but that they must themselves be radically born again in order to enter the kingdom of heaven. With such teaching, she took the emphasis off head knowledge and showed each individual that they were personally responsible before God for their own spiritual life. Hearts were convicted of sin, and fires of revival swept throughout the villages of central China wherever she went. In the 1940s, another Western missionary preached the gospel to my mother, who was 20 years old at the time. Although she didn't fully understand, she was deeply impressed by what she heard. She especially liked to sing the songs and hear the Bible stories shared by the small teams of evangelists who traveled around the countryside. Soon, she started attending church and committed her life to Jesus Christ. China became a communist nation in 1949. Within a few years, all missionaries were expelled, church buildings were closed, and thousands of Chinese pastors were imprisoned. Many lost their lives. My mother saw the missionaries leave Nanyang in the early 1950s. She never forgot the tears in their eyes as they headed for the coast on the armed guard, their ministries for the Lord having abruptly come to an end. In just one city in China, Wenzhou, in Zhejiang province, 49 pastors were sent to prison labor camps near the Russian border in 1950. Many were given sentences of up to 20 years for their crimes of preaching the gospel. Of those 49 pastors, just one returned home. 48 died in prison. In my home area of Nanyang, believers were crucified on the walls of their churches for not denying Christ. Others were chained to vehicles and horses and dragged to their death. One pastor was bound and attached to a long rope. The authorities, enraged that the man of God would not deny his faith, used a makeshift crane to lift him high into the air. Before hundreds of witnesses who had come to accuse him falsely of being a counter-revolutionary, the pastor was asked one last time by his persecutors if he would recant. He shouted back, No, I will never deny the Lord who saved me. The rope was released and the pastor crashed to the ground below. Upon inspection, the tormentors discovered the pastor was not fully dead. So they raised him up into the air for a second time, dropping the rope to finish him off for good. In this life, the pastor was dead. But he lives on with the reward of one who was faithful to the end. Life was not just difficult for Christians. Mayo launched an experiment called the Great Leap Forward, which led to a massive famine all over China. It was actually a great leap backwards for the nation. In my Henan province, it was estimated that 8 million people starved to death. During these difficult times, the small fledgling church in my hometown of Nanyang were scattered. They were like sheep without shepherds. My mother also left the church. Over the following decades, having been completely starved of all Christian fellowship and without God's word, she forgot most of what she learned as a young woman. Her relationship with the Lord grew cold. On September 1, 2001, exactly 100 years to the day 
since Marie Monson first arrived in China to start her missionary career. More than 300 Norwegian Christians gathered in the Bergen graveyard for a special prayer and dedication ceremony. A beautiful new headstone was unveiled in memory of Monson, paid for by contributions from various churches and individual Christians. Monson's picture and her Chinese name appeared on the headstone, which also stated, Marie Monson, 1878-1962, Missionary in China, 1901-1932. When I told the believers in China that Marie Monson's gravestone had been rebuilt, they were thankful and relieved. We must always be careful to remember the sacrifice of those God has used to establish his kingdom. They are worthy of our honor and respect. The end of chapter 1 of the heavenly man, the remarkable true story of Chinese Christian Brother Yun, written with Paul Hathaway. <laughs>